Here, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Naval War College Foundation's Plan to Giving Matters, Navigating Your Legacy Informational Seminar with Rhode Island attorney Eric Archer, where he will speak on topics such as planned giving and tax considerations for 2021 and the benefits of establishing a charitable gift annuity or CGA. I am George Lang, CEO of the Naval War College Foundation. We are extremely proud to offer our members, sponsors, donors, and philanthropists many options in which to support the Naval War College Foundation and the U.S. Naval War College and its mission to educate and develop leaders by building strategic and cultural perspectives and enhancing the capability to advise senior leaders and policymakers who are charged with preserving our national security and outlook for the future. We are grateful to our trustees, regional directors, trustee emeriti, members, sponsors, and friends for their continued support and advocacy for the oldest and preeminent institution of its kind, the U.S. Naval War College. As many of you know, the Naval War College Foundation, powered by its generous members and donors, provides critical funds needed to support the college's unique ability to develop military and civilian leaders who are skilled in the strategic and operational challenges that lie ahead, are dedicated to preserving our national security in a global position of leadership, and are adept at navigating the challenges of war, and most importantly, the prevention of war. We are particularly thankful for the Naval War College Foundation's many Heritage Society members who have provided generous estate plan gifts to support the mission of the Naval War College Foundation and its mission to sustain an academic experience at the college that is focused in three principal areas, military preparedness, leader development, and diplomacy and statesmanship. Heritage Society members are prominently recognized on a plaque in Spruance Hall on the Naval War College campus located in Newport, Rhode Island. Like many planned gifts, membership in the Heritage Society and similar programs helps to sustain the college for posterity. Therefore, I'm extremely thankful for your time and attention this afternoon. The Naval War College Foundation is pleased to present this seminar for our valued members and donors who value our national security and the many freedoms we enjoy today in our great nation and who wanna learn more about how planned giving will not only leave a legacy in an area that is of greatest interest or concern to them, but also benefits a world-class institution charged with developing military and civilian leaders who have taken an oath to protect our national interests and way of life that will benefit our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. I want to now introduce to you your keynote speaker for this afternoon seminar, Mr. Eric Archer, a Rhode Island lawyer with 35 years of estate planning and planned giving experience. He has served as the Director of Development at Rogers Williams University and for the Naval War College Foundation. He continues to advise the Naval War College Foundation as well as Salve Regina University and other local Rhode Island charities on tax and planned giving matters. He is a graduate of Colgate University and Yukon School of Law and now practices with his wife, Deborah Foppert at the firm of Archer, Archer and Foppert LLP in Jamestown, Rhode Island. Following Eric's presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session so should you have a question, please hold it until after Eric's presentation, and he'll try to address as many of them as time permits. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to Mr. Eric Archer. Eric, over to you, sir. Thank you for that kind introduction, George. And um, the only correction I can offer is that uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, much more than any of the other couple of presentations I've, I've done to the foundation. Um, this is topical and for the first time in many, many years, um, the uh, what I do for my main uh, practice area is getting news in every magazine of every political stripe. Um, so I, I really would love to get into the, to the general conversation of where things are heading. Um, this was originally presented uh, again as things that should take place um, before the end of 2021 and the benefits of a charitable gift annuity. I should probably start right out by saying that the, um, the charitable gift annuity is a very versatile approach to a lot of issues. Um, for the very wealthy, uh, people with more than $11 million, uh, particularly people between 11 million and $23 million, the, uh, Charitable gift annuity may be a part of what that class of people might do between now and the end of 2021 to lock in today's very favorable estate and gift tax threshold, $23 million. Um, 
that would be a presentation unto itself. And whether that is better than, you know, using a charitable gift annuity, as opposed to doing something with your own spouse, with these um, devices called SLATs, which are spousal, spousal life annuity trusts, um, there's pros and cons of each. The charitable gift annuity, long and short, would be a good tool for some very high-end folks who want to lock in their current um, tax threshold. It's one of those, if that interests you, talk to me or talk to your own estate planning attorney, um, and I won't try to bog this down because it's not going to apply to all that many people. Um, it would be a particularly versatile for anybody who's up in that value range that doesn't happen to have children or grandchildren that are their primary um, giving uh, intended gift donees. So let's just put a pin in that. But charitable gift annuities continue to be very good under the current legislation. They will, they, they will probably continue to be a means by which the income tax increases that I'm going to be talking about can be mitigated. You know, that there, there's still going to be a great way to make an impact gift um, to create a charitable deduction to offset some of the incoming uh, income tax increases. They're going to continue to be a good way to lock in capital gains without suffering new capital gains rate. Um, but beyond that, I'm not going to talk about ch charitable gift annuities other than maybe picking it up again at the discussion um, timeframe. I do have a, a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to kind of breeze through um, because it'll prime us for, for a more open conversation. So I'll start with the um, uh, first, first slide, what we talked about in the past. Um, last couple of times I've, I've been, done a Zoom presentation for this group. Um, we talked about things that you really should do before you pass away, before you become incompetent, pretty far down the road issues. This is a rare situation where there might be some people, not many, but some who really need to do something in the next two months. And it's gonna take, for those people who are affected, it's going to take two months to get in place what needs to be put in place. Um, I would think most of the people who are in the 11.7 to $23 million range I'm gonna to continue to refer to have been being kind of pinged by their advisors. and. Uh, are probably you know, being reminded they gotta really deal with this and it's gonna be a slow process to, to lock in the current very favorable tax situation for those people who really should do that. Um, so uh, if you were in that, uh, I'd love to talk to you towards the end of this um, and uh, at least lead you in the direction of what you should do to get started. So I'll go to the next, uh, next slide. <laughs> It's gonna be worth giving you, a, this is a little text rich, sorry about that, um, but it, it's going to be worth giving you a little bit of sort of fundamental state tax history because it'll help you understand what's coming along with the current legislation and, and some, some sea changes um, that are afoot. One of the most important things to understand is that whenever you hear talk about a threshold of of an estate tax. It's always a combined threshold for all the gifts you make during your lifetime, plus what you might be leaving at your death. You're given a single number that you can leave to the next generation that is all in for both lifetime gifts and, and state transfers. It, be, it had been called the Unified Estate Gift Tax. Um, that's been around since the 70s. The uh, Gifts between spouses never have, never will, and no change is imminent. Um, there will never be a tax on gifts between spouses. You can have a gazillion dollars and still um, leave assets to your spouse. That's been around for almost forever. That's not going to change. What has changed, and the next slide will be a gradual, you know, we'll list the list of them, and I'll get to that in a second. But what has changed is the increment at which um, the, the threshold at which a tax would kick in as you leave assets to your children or anybody who's not a spouse, other than a charity. Um, that has been gradually going up and then had a very precipitous jump up in the last four years. Put a pin in that. That's gonna be the, the main change coming down the pike right now is that that temporary spike in that threshold is, is possibly gonna go away. Um, another important, fairly recent development is that a couple is now given the credit that you know, that, that both of them hold, and it isn't necessary to take steps on the first death in order to take advantage of that spouse's credit 
and then take the, the exact same steps at the second death to take care of that spouse's credit. The concept called portability has been around for about 10 years now and um, is uh, really helpful. It, it, greatly simplifies estate planning. There used to be a, a step where you had to make sure you locked in one person's credit at the first of the two couple of death. And then at the second death, you, you do the second. That's all gone by the wayside. And the, at least at the federal level, um, you are just given a credit, currently $23 million, uh, to share between um, the two spouses. Uh, it means that if one spouse has a million dollars and happens to die first and the other one has $22 million, that's fine. You report um, the use of that first spouse's million dollars and you got $22 million coming down the road. So some of the old things that had to be done um, that took a tremendous amount of lawyer time, um, such as segregating your assets somewhat equally between the two spouses, doesn't really have to be done for a federal estate tax purposes right now. I keep saying federal, and I will touch briefly on state estate taxes. A state, state, most states estate tax scenarios are kind of like the old federal, where you have to do some things on the first death to take advantage of that spouse's credit, and then take an additional step on the second death. Usually, the state estate tax um, burden is not huge. Um, think of you know ten percent being a pretty high number for a state. Um, but states still may require you to take some steps on the first death in order to lock in that spouse's state credit and then a second um, step on the second death. Um, so getting to the more recent history here. Um, in 2017, uh, the threshold for the um, federal tax, which is the $11.7 million per person or $23.4 million per couple, was introduced and it was introduced specifically with a sunset, which is always the word that is given to legislation that is really only designed to stick around for a few years. And not surprisingly, the timing of the sunset, of that temporary spike in the threshold was designed to be the end of 24, which is an election year. So it was going to be kind of anticipated from the beginning that one of the platform uh, tenets of, uh, of, of the GOP in particular would, would be to protect this bump in the threshold from $11.7 million per couple to $23 million per couple. Because of that, it's a very easy thing to simply accelerate. And you'll see in a later slide, that is exactly what happens. But let's go to the next slide. And you'll see how the credit has grown uh, since the 90s. It looks like uh, um, geometric growth here, you know, but it is somewhat linear growth. If you think about how at values double every seven years in theory, um, and you keep doubling and compounding the doubling, everything was kind of on track and growing at a, at a, you know, pretty good clip, well in excess of inflation, even in excess of the value at which real estate and equities were increasing in value until 2017. When it doubled to $11.18 million per spouse, uh, that was a that was an outlier. You know, the rest of the stuff is all sort of consistent with history. That was a big spike. And I think even when it was passed, it, you know, it was kind of assumed that it might only last a few years. Um, so if you trace it all the way down here, the, the, the likely point at which the the state tax threshold will settle even after further um, political wrangling will be kind of more like the 2017 levels that you know 5,005 you know 5.5 million that kind of thing I think um, rather than than the 11.7 million dollars per person figure. Um, let's go to the next slide. All of this is so inefficient. It, it, it is it is ridiculous how little revenue is generated by the estate tax and how much effort goes into it and how many lawyers are employed fighting it. Um, so that this is just an indication of the percent of estates that ever faced an estate tax has always been low. It spiked briefly there for a while, um, the 70s and explain why that was where the 600 was all of a sudden, all of a sudden was not a very big number, you know. But once they fixed the $600,000 threshold, 
went back to affecting very few people, you know, one percent, two percent. If this were a full one hundred percent graph, this thing would just all be flatlined towards the bottom. Not only are few states affected, but except for some of the Depression era uh, years, um, it's a blip in the federal budget anyway. It's only one or two, three percent. Um, so all of this effort and attention to um, change and fritter around with um, the uh, one or two percent part of the budget always seems uh, out of whack to me, even though it is part of what I do rely on for my revenue. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. This is an interesting one in that you'll see how it, you know, there's not very much um, very not very much record, reported uh, value in, in many many estates are not taxable at all. If you look at the difference between the bottom uh, line of the left graph, figure H, and the top line of the left graph, figure H, um, that entire area is non-taxable estate that has to be reported on an estate tax return. Typically, it's on the first death when there's a couple, but it's just it's an indication of just how much detail has to eventually be reported to the IRS, <clears throat> even though not all that many people actually owe a tax and not all that many people, um, you know, more people have to file than, than owe a tax and, and it, it never amounts to very much money. Figure I is just to point out that uh, charitable giving in an, in an estate is always valuable. Um, and, you know, it's not an insignificant thing. So that to be true to my, you know, uh, calling of, of being a plan giving uh, advocate. Um, it is, you know, roughly 20, 30% of the people who, um, who make charitable gifts make a gift of 20 or 30% of their, of their estates. Um, so you would be in good company if you were to choose to do that. Um, there's gonna be mutual, you know, mutual advantage of any charitable gift. Uh, in particular, uh, if you were to make a charitable gift, you're always motivated to make it during life rather than on death because it achieves a double, a double impact. Um, you're getting a charitable income tax deduction and you're also reducing the size of your estate. So you're getting an estate tax uh, exemption and the combination makes it so that you can often give um, half of, you know, you, you can often give $100,000 to a charity at the expense of $50,000 that that, that would have otherwise gone to family. You know, that um, for those that face an estate tax, charitable giving remains and is gonna be even even more important aspect of the um, upcoming uh, estate plan. Let's go to the next slide. And Erica, I have a question. Um, you know, it, we're talking large numbers, but people can also affect their estates by making, you know, depending upon the size of the, the estate, it's, it's all proportionate to the, the gift. The size of the gift is proportionate to the size of the estate. So a large gift for uh, an uber wealthy donor versus, a, a, you know, a large gift for, I'll even say myself, for example, um, it, it's just all relative. So if I make a CGA of $20,000, it can still uh, be advantageous to my estate, uh, depending upon what my estate is, correct? Correct. And I guess that I probably should have even had a slide earlier than this. You can tell I'm trying to blast through the slides to, to get to more open conversation, but there's a lot of attention paid to estate taxes, even though it doesn't apply to very many people, which I guess is most of the point that I've made in the past, but income taxes apply to everybody. And the thing about charitable gifts is that, um, and charitable gift annuities in particular, is that the, um, the impact on, a, on income taxes is a magnitude greater. It's, it's, it's much more, uh, the charitable giving is much more of an income tax of uh, you know, abatement uh, tool than it is an estate tax abatement pool and yet tool. And yet a lot of times people think of the estate tax as being this onerous thing. So most of the revenue that is being raised by the current legislation is found in increases in the income taxes, which apply to everybody almost. Um, and the even though in the past plan giving had always been viewed as something that's helpful for <clears throat> estate tax implications, 
it's, it's going to be a bigger part of income tax implications. Going back and forth between these two taxes is even hard for me. It's always hard when I'm trying to explain it to clients, um, and I'll do my best now. Um, but if you look at the uh, Ways and Means Committee's summary of what they're going to propose in the legislation, which will be 2,000 pages thick, even the summary, um, I'll show it here, is uh, 20 some odd pages. Um, most of it will relate to income taxes. I can say unequivocally that capital gains is going to be the biggest single, you know, actually the, the, the increases in the capital gains is, is one of the few things that will move the meter in terms of how much revenue is raised in the forego in the you know the forthcoming years. Um, very simply, it is very likely that the thresholds for the capital gains tax um, top rate, which had been roughly five hundred thousand dollars, are going to probably drop to four hundred thousand dollars, and the top rate will increase by five percent. So all of a sudden, the capital gains rate may be um, as much as 25% at the federal level, another 6% for both, a lot of states, Rhode Island included, at the state level, and potentially above that, a 3.8% Medicaid surcharge for whatever that comes out to, 25, 6, 31, 34%, you know, certainly over one third of capital gain may become um, Taxable, you know, the, the tax rate might be a total of one third of, of any gain you, you receive. So going back to charitable gift annuities, um, if it turns out that you have a bunch of gain and you're really thinking maybe now's the time to cash out, cashing out by acquiring, a, by, by funding a charitable gift annuity or theoretically a more, more robust thing called the charitable remainder trust, um, might allow you to sell assets with a bunch of appreciation on them um, and reinvest and get an income stream out of 100% of the value of those assets as opposed to just 67% of those assets. So the current legislation, this, and actually um, I will ask Shannon to, to, to send along the link to the, um, to the Ways and Means summary, not particularly enlightening, but, uh, but you know, she'll, she'll uh, provide a, a link after the, uh, presentation, uh, how, to, how to read this directly. Um, most of it relates to um, income taxes, the biggest single fundraising, you know, the big, biggest thing, re revenue raising measure that applies to individuals is, will probably be the capital gains uh, increases. There's obviously a, a corporate increase as well contemplated and Certainly, there is an indirect impact of any increase in corporate level taxation on an individual. But in terms of things that a person can plan around, capital gains taxes are going to probably be the primary uh, new focus of plan giving and, and charitable giving and just general year end planning for the next next few years. Um, and uh, Eric, what is, uh, you know, when we're talking about deferring taxes and all these things, uh, could you speak a little bit about how required minimum distributions can help do that as well? So required minimum distributions and distributions from qualified plans generally always take some strategizing and always take some uh, sort of uh, tea leaf reading. Um, generally, it's always best to defer uh, claiming any income for as long as possible, except for situations where you know you're going to be taxed a lot more if you wait. So uh, one of the things that that relating to the new legislation that is that is important to consider is do you do you possibly accelerate your distributions, take some money now to keep you out of some of the punitive tax rates that may be looming in the future? If if, for example, you are in that bubble between making four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars, that's a big number, but I'll explain that it could apply to more people than you think. Um, and you know that the following year you're going to be, you are going to be above four, but under five, you might want to move um, and just go ahead and take a big chunk of uh, of uh, your qualified retirement money as long as you're over 
um, 59 and a half, go ahead and pay the tax and avoid the, the much harsher tax that's likely to be in place next year. Um, so generally you have to take your required minimum distributions. There are ways that you can use a charity to kind of shift, you know, to kind of avoid the taxes on doing so if that money is not important to you. But you also would want to make sure that you look at your year-end uh, retirement withdraws um, strategically and decide if possibly you're going to choose to pay a tax a little sooner than you must um, to, to lock in today's slightly better income tax rates. Um, same thing with uh, timing capital gains events. Uh, the, um, Could I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, so I'm what you just said, there was a, an asterisk that I didn't hear, the verbal asterisk. Advisors have, in my experience, advisors have always spoken about uh, taking taking gains or converting to Roth, that kind of thing, to, to get the taxable stuff out of the way early. But the caveat that it really only makes sense for people to do that who have the cash flow to deal with the taxes without har harming the corpus of the conversion is that part of what you're talking about at all? Yeah, I, so that in addition to tax planning and, 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 max, and making the maximum advantageous uh, tax rates, you have to look at whether or not you're going to have the liquidity to pay the tax when it's due, and whether you know your whether your growth inside of um, your retirement plan is going to be on the full amount is going to out offset the um, value of taking advantage of a lower tax rate now than in the future years. So you, you sort of have to make every withdrawal decision with a lot of variables in mind. And the, you know, the beauty of, of managed investment advisors, a lot of them are great at what they do and they don't charge, they already charge, you know, that, um, that you know, unlike lawyers and accountants who charge by the hour, the, if you can get a good, good financial planner and, and you're um, you know, paying 1% a year anyway, take advantage of her or him and just, just really, you know, say, okay, let's just, let's just not rush this and not talk about it in November or March. Um, let's kind of give this some thought. And your point, which is conversions to a Roth, um, that's a huge decision. Um, you know, what I've read is that a lot of people are going to um, convert to Roths uh, towards the end of this year to, to go ahead and lock in, you know, go ahead and pay some gain, but at least keep themselves out of the most punitive numbers. Um, the, there are definitely, you know, you need to know where you are in relation to the thresholds that are in, that are baked into this law. And, and for those people who may have a year that puts them into the 400 to $500,000 range, that's huge. You know, staying, staying um, underneath whatever the threshold is that is that has been identified as the wealthy that is going to be asked to pay for some of the current spending um, is important enough. And you have to think in terms of hidden types of gain that could, could put you into the $400,000 range, even if you don't think of yourself as somebody who makes that kind of money very often. Um, so sales of vacation homes are a biggie. Uh, you know, you got your, got your exemption from houses, from sales of $500,000 for your primary home, but People who are selling selling vacation homes uh, in, in the in the uh, context of this current spike in the value of real estate, you know, have to think in terms of the fact that they could be four hundred thousand dollar heirs um, very easily uh, with, with just a just a modest amount of growth on, on vacation homes. Um, uh, inheritances sometimes have a have an impact on on you know a spike in income in a particular year. And I was very happy to see that that. Among the various people logging in here is a couple of other lawyers, um, and uh, take advantage of <laughs> that. You know, try to try to line up. You know, I mean, I'm just pushing pushing legal legal services here so much, but take advantage of uh, the little bit of gap you have between the time that you're that the that the likely course of the current legislation is known and the end of the year to just not not feel rushed. So, so do take it. Do do particularly for financial planners who are not in the middle of an October 15th deadline. Just line it up this time to say, what do you know about the new law? And you know, I'm going to be scattershot for a little bit between the various things that apply to my particular talk. But a lot of the new law relates to income taxes and is going to be beyond the scope of this conversation. And you know, conversions to a Roth is a, is a big part of this. Uh, so 
So the, so let's talk about the pros that made it that that have gone away. So you hear a lot about some stuff, and uh, a lot of it's gone by the wayside, and I don't think it's going to come back. Um, so two things: one is the elimination of the step up in basis. When you inherit assets, if they've appreciated in value, because of the possibility that you may have have owed an estate tax, there's not an additional capital gains tax bite taken out of the assets you inherit, or else the 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 effective taxable rate could be 80% on what you inherit. So for, for as long as I've been practicing 35 or more years, uh, 40 years, there has always been a step up in basis. That was, there was talk about eliminating that where you, you could inherit assets. And if your parents who bought them paid $10 for assets that are not worth $2,000 a share, you know, $10 a share for $2,000 a share, that gain from 10 to 2,000 would still be yours to bear even if you sell it 20 years after you inherit it. That was proposed. That was a that was a Biden proposal, and I think like a couple of others, it's probably a throwaway. Is it? It was. It's totally unworkable. It's just would be god god awful. The IRS won't want to audit these things. You'd be meeting with people who are in their hundreds, asking them, you know, in their eighties, asking them to like recreate what they paid for assets in their nineteen thirties. You know, it's so. I think that was that was put in there as something that they could throw away in favor of stuff that was important. You know, that they really wanted to get into this new legislation. So. It's, Step up and basis rules seem fine. They don't seem like they're under pressure. They weren't in this outline. Um, they'll probably be fine. There's also talk about a much more significant move from $23 million um, down to $7 million for a couple instead of $23 million down to $11.7 million for a couple. That would have been a pendulum swing back in the direction of being lower than historically tracked. You know, that, um, that, that would have been back to that spike in revenue that I talked to you that, that, that I showed you where 600 had gotten to be a relatively modest amount. And it was the threshold, $600,000 was the threshold for a while when a lot of people had $600,000. Same thing with $7 million now. That would be, you know, a fairly low threshold that would affect 10, 20, you know, percent of the population instead of, um, it would, it would, it would, greatly magnified by probably a magnitude of 10, the number of people who would be within the scope of, of an estate tax. I don't think that's coming in. You look at the practical side of things. It didn't make it to this um, summary proposal. And every donor to every con congressman in, in the um, Congress uh, comes from people with $7 million. Nobody wants to sort of bite the golden goose there. So I think the $11.7 .7 million will stick. It was the easiest thing to accelerate. It's the easiest politically thing to do because it only involved one sentence in this in this summary that I'm telling you about. That I'll I'll say it just said um, this provision terminates the temporary increase in the unified credit, and that one sentence didn't require a lot of explanation. Didn't require a lot of um, political wrangling because all they were all all that is being proposed is that a change in the tax that was already inevitable gets accelerated from 2025 to now. I kind of saw that one coming, <laughs> um, you know, even, even before the, before I saw the print. So um, last thing that's happening and you'll read about it and 99.99% of the people can um, not even give it any thought is, is that, the, that they are trying to eliminate various kind of aggressive estate planning measures that all the state planners at least talk to their clients about fairly often. Um, and for people that practice in New York City with uber wealthy folks, you know these were these were a staple. But there is there is legislation to eliminate grants, grant to retained annuity trust, um, particularly zeroed out grants, which are a category of them that's really for for the ultra wealthy, and things called defective grantor trusts. Um, and they're also uh, changing the rules by which you value assets in your estate. They're trying to, to counteract the, the, the value of minority interest discounts, stuff like that. None of that's gonna to apply to many people. Um, but if, if it turns out that you are worried about the estate tax, there are some things that have always worked. And by, by, them, by legislation that says, as of a certain date, these things are no longer effective. By implication, if you do them before that date, they're sort of blessing. So those with, those with concern about $11.7 million threshold for state taxes should jump now, strike now while the iron's hot. So go to the next slide. Um, we've kind of talked about this one already. Uh, 
I actually written this slide before I had the benefit of the, uh, the uh, summary that came out like September 11th or 19th, whatever it was. Um, and uh, the one thing that, that really made it was this, this drop in the value of the bond threshold from 23 million to $11.7 million. I think that there will be further efforts to undo some of the gizmos that lawyers tend to do. And I'm all for that. You know, I, I, I think it's silly to, to spend a lot of time creating completely complex trusts that make no sense. Dynasty trusts, that would be a whole conversation. Um, but I think that, those, that, that there is a movement afoot to eliminate the ability for those of wealth to keep their wealth outside of the estate tax turnstile um, for, deck, for generations on end. That's gonna end. So if you happen to be the fourth generation of a, of a, a old you know, business tycoon from the 1800s, you know, that's, that's the, the, the wealth that, that the current legislation is really trying to figure out a way to tax. And you know, there has been some abuses over the years and they're trying to reverse those abuses. I'm kind of all for it. Um, so most of the estate tax things will not affect you. So go to the next one. And in fairness, um, most of the income tax provisions really are aimed at, at you know, pretty high-end folks. Um, <clears throat> the uh, $501,000 uh, threshold might go down to $400,000, but, but a lot of, you know, if, you, if that is the, the number that you need to stay below, you just have to think in terms of when you can time your income. And that is another area where plan giving can often be helpful where you can lock in some gains and accelerate some income into one year that you could then claim as a deduction of in a subsequent year you know basically if you just remember from this short conversation that it's really more than ever a question of um, trying to think in a five-year time frame um, you know try to make sure you know which 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 laws are going to be effective what year um, you, you might be able to reduce tax bite by 5% fairly easily by, by just careful timing and planning. Um, so next slide. This I've already talked about a little bit. You know, remember that there are things that happen in your life that, um, that, that are taxable that you don't think of. I already said the sale of vacation home, obviously sale of a, a personal business um, inheritance. There's been some changes in the inheritance rules where it used to be that relatively young children of older parents um, can inherit a uh, retirement plan and stretch it out over their entire lifetime. Um, now there's a 10 year rule that you have to withdraw it within 10 years so that, that there's been a movement for the last few years to make it harder to defer um, income uh, perpetually um, from retirement assets. So those come into play if it turns out you're worried about your threshold under the new income tax laws. Next slide. And now we're really kind of getting into the general conversation stage, which is everything you've always done under any prior law, you know, uh, um, set of, of tax legislation is sort of on steroids now. You know, that um, that uh, if it turns out that you know you're going to sell something anyway, that's going to trigger capital gains. There is no question whatsoever that you're going to be better off doing it now. Than later. Um, that is the one kind of tax. Um, I think it was Mr. Leach that said, uh, you know, do you choose to uh, do a, um, a Roth conversion now? That's a debatable thing. But if it turns out you can time your capital gains, do it now. Um, there is always a chance that the capital gains rate, instead of just jumping from 20 to 25%, the top capital gains rate, it might just be you know, that for the for the very high income earners, it might be whatever your income tax rate is, which would be higher than twenty five percent. And the um, the threshold is likely to continue to to waffle, but you know, four or five hundred thousand dollars is 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 you know it's, it's it, it does affect more people than the federal state tax in any case. Um, and the thing about the capital gains thresholds and some of the other thresholds is, if it turns out that you incur if your combined income and capital gains put you into that five hundred or four hundred thousand dollar class, it's not as though the last B 
bit that's above the 400 is what's taxed, it's all the way back to the first. So if you happen to have $410,000 of capital gains in a 400,000 um, year uh, dollar taxable threshold year, your entire 410,000 is taxed at that new punitive rate. It's not as just the 10,000 by which you exceed beyond the threshold. So that threshold becomes a really important planning consideration. Um, and that is where actually charitable gift annuities could be very helpful. Uh, if you could do something to make sure that, you know, you reduce the total impact of your capital gains just to get you below that threshold, that's a, that's a significant thing. So those people who are anticipating a taxable event like the sale of a vacation home um, or the inheritance of a, of a IRA or something like that, um, you know, may, may look at, at charitable giving as a win-win uh, thing. And if you, if you are in a position where you want to um, lock in your income from the thing that you give away to a charity, that's where plan giving comes in. Most of the plan giving gizmos um, are aimed at retaining some value from the assets that you're selling, allowing the charity to sell them instead of you, because charities don't owe the capital gains tax, and getting a getting a full income stream from the full value rather than just the after tax value of whatever you donate. But you know, think about your capital gains events, think about any big income years you have and plan, you know, plan your sales and possibly use charities as a, as a mechanism to time income and deductions. PRUTs and G CGAs, all these acronyms, the, the state, the state planners love acronyms, are gonna be as important as ever. I think that's my last slide, but let's see. Yeah, good. So. Sorry to blast through all that, but I wanted to get to a more more open conversation if that's helpful for anybody. Um, yeah, and I see a perfect timing, Eric. So uh, I know you invited questions during, but uh, we do have a few minutes, almost 10 minutes or so for an open conversation or questions that uh, guests might have. I'll open the floor and, and just please uh, um, shout out your question. <laughs> I almost feel like being a law professor and picking on somebody. So, so, uh, Mr. Jonas, what kind of a lawyer are, are you? A, do you do estate planning too? Or we have a question from Mary. Okay. okay. Hi. 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 I, I have a question. I'm with Mary right now. Um, with proceeds, you you struck a, a chord with me on the the proceeds from a vacation home sale, which um. I just happened to close on a week ago. <laughs> and I'm wondering, um, it, can, I, uh, can I put that into a Roth IRA? It's a considerable okay. amount. Well, okay. I mean, a couple of things, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to bear bad news, but um, there are a couple of things that can be done before you sell something. Once you sell something and the closing has happened, you've, you've recognized your gain. And, and now what you're really doing is, is trying to figure out if there's something you can do to offset that gain. Um, you will owe capital gains on the difference between your basis and your, and your sales price and all that. Um, and this could be a year that if you can think of something that you would wanna do that would generate a charitable deduction, you could at least use the charitable deduction against, use it all up in one year. A lot of times if people do a planned gift, they can't, use all the charitable deduction that, that it allows. So the charitable gift annuity is probably a more likely, at least something to kick around than um, a putting something into a Roth. The, you know, you're, you're limited in the speed with which you can put assets into either a Roth or a, a conventional IRA. It's you know, a few thousand dollars a year kind of thing. You certainly would wanna do whatever you can do to take advantage of whatever, whatever um, retirement contribution you can make this year, but that's all based on the percentage of your total income and all that. So you could be kind of capped out. Um, so definitely maximize your IRA, or whatever, but you're not gonna be able to use a vehicle to turn this into deferred income for yourself. Since and, I'm, does and, it make any difference if I'm already retired? Are there any um, age, age limitations? Uh, not, not really. I mean, other than the, yeah, so, so other than the fact that you've got relatively little uh, opportunity to fund a retirement vehicle. I mean, if it, you know, this is not considered um, income earned from a from a trade or business. This is this is capital gains. So that it's not like you could put fifteen percent of the proceeds from that in, into a, either a conventional retirement asset or a or a Roth. You know, so sadly enough, um, you know that that is 
but you're better off having sold it this year than next, I almost guarantee you. So a combination of the fact that the market is pretty mm -hmm. across the United States, the market's pretty hot, and the fact that the capital gains are not going to go down, you, you probably did a right thing. So well, and, and I might just add, um, if if you are into interest is possibly in a charitable gift annuity, um, and we can send you the, the information, but you can go to our website and we actually have, we can either do an illustration for you, but we also have a self calculator. So if you want to do it in the privacy of your own home and figure out, well, hey, if I did, you know, a $100,000 charitable gift annuity or 200,000 or a 50,000, whatever the number is, uh, you're, you're able to do a do it yourself calculation. And it's very simple. If I can do it, anyone can do it. And, and so we can send you that information where you could do an illustration in the privacy of your own home in case you decide that it's a chair, giving it to a charity and getting an annuity and an income stream is the way you want to go. Thank you. And, Thank you. And, and, you know, to follow up on that conversation with, you know, people who are thinking about doing things rather than have just done things, it's pretty rare that a, that a person would donate a, a house to, to a charity right before they sell it in order to turn that into a charitable gift annuity, you know, I've never seen it. I've been doing plan giving for 35 years. Um, but it isn't as uncommon for somebody to give away some appreciated securities before they sell. It's just something emotionally different between a house and, and securities. And if it turns out you're planning and selling highly appreciated securities, that is a more entirely likely candidate that, that there's going to be almost as much return for you if you donate it to a charity and let the charity sell it and then just take the income stream as it would be from taking it yourself. Usually it's a loss to your children if, if you know that's your primary estate planning objective, but sometimes not as much of a loss as you think, so. Hi, Eric, Roy Douglas. Um, <clears throat> my question is, uh, well, I have two. I missed the first five minutes. Uh, first off, can you take a non- uh, IRA or 401k, just a straight up investment, and before sale, make it into a CRT. That's the first question. Okay, so so um, a, a non IRA, so it's not qualified money, and before you sell it, but it's appreciated, right? You know, right. it's a highly highly appreciated thing. So, yeah, the, and the CRT he's referring to is called the Charitable Remainder Trust. Um, and yes, it's the, you know, the simple answer. You could put the appreciated asset into a CRT beforehand, charitable remainder trust, have that trust sell it, and then it would be selling it within the tax-free envelope. So what you're almost kind of doing is creating almost like a little foundation. You know, some people think of them as kind of the, the entry-level foundation approach to things. And if you had $200,000 of highly appreciated Tesla. Actually, that was the last time I talked about this. We used that as an example. And you put it into the CRT before you sell it. All of a sudden, it's the charity selling it, really, in effect. And you're getting the value of the income stream for the full $200,000 rather than the post tax value, you know, the post tax income stream on um, $130,000. So, yes, I think is the answer to your question. Okay. And the second one by either you and or Carla is does, do CRTs or does the Naval Foundation accept cryptocurrencies? That's a Carla. Uh, That's probably a good I don't idea. have a full <laughs> answer on that one, but I can get back to you, Roy, on that. Because if, if we do, you would be the first, um, maybe we'd have to put your name on the wall somewhere special as being the first, but I, I could get back to you on that. So well, I will. I can take a guess at, at a couple of things. In any um, charitable gift, you have to. The you know, most important thing is to be able to document the value of the asset you're transferring. And as long as there's a that there's a ready market, you know, people donate art. Right? So that that um, my guess is that that it'd be worth worth the foundation's while or anybody else's um, anybody any other charities you wish to think about. And as long as it's valuable, and as long as it can be valued. You can do it because it, it, anything that the foundation can sell, it basically holds instantaneously as the owner and then liquidates. Even if it turns out you donate a bunch of Tesla, if that's not in their investment portfolio objective, you know that particular segment of the investment thing, they're going to sell it anyway. So they can sell they can sell stocks, they can sell sell uh, 
uh, would be my guess. They could sell uh, cryptocurrency. Yes, and that, and I would I would reiterate that. I mean, that was a perfect way of explaining it. You know, so but and I'd love to work with you on it, Roy. And in the twenty years that or so of my relationship with the Naval War College, the only thing that it didn't accept, interestingly, was a really cool sixty-five foot yacht. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons that and, and one of the reasons that people want one of the reasons the donor was thinking about giving it is because it's, it's on the water and it has actually a marina and all that. And because of the carrying costs and whatever else, uh, and the fact that the donor was really hoping that the foundation wouldn't sell it right away and, and all that, that, the foundation didn't accept it because if this foundation received it and it was valued at two million dollars, whatever it was, and then turned around and sold it for five hundred thousand dollars, it winds up coming back and back biting the 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 hand of the donor. Um, you know, that, that, and we actually start, steered them to a place that would use it for a number of years in order to swap, satisfy a certain safe harbor. So pretty much, you know, whatever you want to give shorty yachts, you know, give us a shot. Yeah, um, and, you know, uh, I would reiterate, you know, in, in my 35 year career, the only gift I ever saw that was ever turned down was property that had some, it used to be a gas station and it would have some serious environmental issues before that would have to be taken care of before it was sold. So typically, uh, if, as Eric says, if a value is placed on it and, and we can turn around and realize that value, typically the answer is yes. I appreciate it. And I suppose I won't be the last one because <laughs> <laughs> institutions, <clears throat> um, you know, it's moving forward if, if you're watching the news, even on the peripheries. So I appreciate the, your time and, and this is a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Other questions? At this point, I typically thank you, Eric. And then of course I introduce Carla, but it seems like Carla, you might be already a known commodity on the, on the virtual network here. So, uh, Without any further ado, why don't I pass the mic to you uh, for some comments as well. Well, thanks again, George. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, the fact that you, you're you on this uh, call or this Zoom tells us that you not only know and understand the value that a plan gift can have on your own financial situation, but also that you understand um, the value that it can have uh, on the Naval War College, specifically through us as the Naval War College Foundation. Uh, the impact of a, of a planned gift is immeasurable. And as George says, uh, you know, you, you are the, the people who power our institution so that we could affect positive impact on things like development of military and civilian leaders, uh, strategy, operational challenges, not just for today, but tomorrow, and ensure our national and global position of leadership and our national security. Uh, plan gifts help you leave a legacy. I and mean, we've talked a lot about the financial aspects of plan gifts, but the philanthropic side is that plan gifts really help you leave a legacy. And oftentimes people who may not make a very large gift while they are alive because they have familial uh, obligations and other things can really make a lasting impact through a planned gift. Uh, so we ask you that if we are already in your estate plans, uh, one of the things that we wanna stress is that please make sure that we are properly listed as the beneficiary, which would be Naval War College Foundation. We've learned from a lot of our generous Heritage Society members that some of them have it simply as Naval War College and it must say Naval War College Foundation. And when we receive it, we ensure that the Naval War College is a beneficiary and, and benefits from your generosity. We also ask that if we're already in your estate plan and you've yet to share any kind of documentation that perhaps you can do this. And we don't mean that you have to give us your entire will or your entire trust or whatever it means. It could be a redacted version, but something that shows us exactly what you're planning to do so that we're prepared uh, you know, at, at that appointed time. And then lastly, we ask that if we're not in your estate plan, we ask that you consider uh, putting us in, in it. Uh, as I said, 
your support through a plan gift can have critical impact uh, through our foundation on the U.S. Naval War College and all its work that it does and has been doing for over a century. Before I close my remarks, I just want to recognize, as George mentioned, uh, the Heritage Society is our plan giving society for those who have uh, put us in their estate plans. And I'd like to recognize two generous members of the Heritage Society who passed just this past year. One is Trustee Emerita Barbara Epstein, and then the other is Life Member Andrew Combe. Through their generous plan gifts, they have left an everlasting legacy at the U.S. Naval War College. And for this, we are eternally grateful. Uh, and, and, and then lastly, if you are interested in discussing a charitable gift, either I or my colleagues can assist you uh, at whatever level, please just feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Carla. And for those who, who, who might not know Carla, Carla, Dr. Carla Narowski, is our president and, and chief development officer. She's got over 30 years of experience in this space, including plan giving. So uh, really a blessing for the foundation to have her level of expertise on the staff. And she's, like she says, she's standing by to assist. Um, and again, uh, Eric, thank you for your time. Uh, these, are, these are terrific presentations. Certainly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to spend it with us and our members and guests today. Well, I'll, I'll wait, uh, um, and thank you for, for allowing me the opportunity. A couple of the questions that were asked today, in honesty, feel free to get my contact information or Carl, whatever else. I kind of like talking about this stuff. So like for, for if anybody is genuinely thinking about a charitable uh, a charitable remainder trust, which is generated by a lawyer and a law firm in support of not just a charity, but a, as many charities as you want to support, um, give me a call. You know, I don't charge to just chat through stuff. And um, you know, it's, it's kind of fun stuff to talk about. So Carla has my contact information. She might even be on some of the stuff that's been presented, but particularly charitable major trusts. They're kind of cool. They're fun to talk about. Give me a call. So thanks for the opportunity. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. And I hope you like what you do. You've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our plan giving informational seminar. For additional details, please visit our website at NWC foundation dot, um, correction, nwcfoundation.giftplans.org. Um, if I could sum up today's you know, presentation, a plan to give is an invaluable way to provide support to the Naval War College Foundation and U.S. Naval War College while accommodating your own personal financial estate planning and, and philanthropic goals. Uh, with some detailed research and planning, you could actually increase the value of your estate and or reduce the tax burden for your heirs. It can, it can also provide you some peace of mind that you've made a significant contribution to the safety and security of your family and friends and the plan gift contribution to the Naval War College Foundation. We recommend that you familiarize yourself with the various gift options on our website by exploring how to give and what to give, and then compare gift options and or calculate, as, as Carl said, calculate how your planned gift could work for you. We also have a available uh, helpful brochure that we would be happy to mail uh, to you or, or continue this conversation via email or phone, as Eric suggests. The Naval War College Foundation staff stands ready to support you as needed please feel free to reach out to us at any time for additional advice or counsel. Thank you again for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay safe.